Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Was the American Revolution Avoidable? An online professional development seminar from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. Now, I'm going to go through our introductory material rather quickly tonight because we have a lot of territory to cover. The National Humanities Center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. The main program we offer here is a fellowship program that brings scholars to the center for an academic year to research and write books and articles on topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, and criticism of the arts. We opened in 1978, and since then, we've had about 1,100 scholars pass through our doors, and they've produced about 1,200 books. Now, the place may seem like an ivory tower, but it's really not. The founders wanted it to reach a wide array of audiences, and they're particularly interested in reaching teachers. We do that in three ways. First of all, our online seminar programs, which you have discovered. We also offer three instructional guides on a site called TeacherServe, Divining America, Religion and the National Culture, Nature, Nature Transformed, the Environment in American History, and Freedom Story, Teaching African American Literature and History. These offer essays written by leading scholars on topics in those areas, and they also offer advice on how to teach those topics. Then we offer our toolbox library. These are teaching anthologies of primary sources, literary text, historical documents, images, and audio material, organized thematically within chronological frames and illuminated by extensive notes and interpretive questions. They really make excellent classroom teaching resources. You can find out about future seminars and new resources by becoming a fan on our Facebook page. We urge you to do that. That way you won't miss out on anything new from the National Humanities Center's education programs. Now, after this seminar, our, a recording of this program, our PowerPoint, uh, will be available on the Was the American Revolution website. Uh, you also find there an evaluation we ask you to complete that evaluation and send it to us. You can submit it online. This is very important to us. We pay attention to what you say in the evaluations, and we try to improve the seminars based on what we find there. We also invite you to plunder our PowerPoint. It's there for your use. If you want to use any of the text from the seminar, you want to use any of the excerpts, please take, make it, take, uh, take advantage of the PowerPoint. <clears throat> it's there for your use. Now, you will receive from us documentation of participation. This will be a letter that you'll get in an email that you'll be able to present to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit your participation in the seminar this evening warrants. Now, let me explain how the seminar is going to work. Uh, this will be a lecture keyed to a presentation of slides with text excerpts that illustrate important points. Some of the excerpts will analyze through discussion, others will not. However, we present them all to you as potential instructional tools for your teaching. Again, let me invite you to plunder our PowerPoint. Now, Professor Green has asked me to read the slides as we go through them this evening, and I will do that to put them on the table for our consideration. Now, you can participate either by speaking up orally or by uh, chat. Let me show you how to do that if you want to raise uh, your hand uh, and ask a question through your microphone, click on the hand raised icon that you see there that my little green arrow has pointed out. I will see that icon and at an opportune moment, I'll pass the microphone to you and you can hold forth with your question or your comment. If you do that, please hit the hand raised mic icon a second time so that we erase the icon from uh, next to your name. If you don't do that, we'll be there all evening, and you'll be in danger of having me call on you when you don't have anything to say. Now, if you want to chat, you can, bring, you can do that by putting your cursor in the chat box there where my arrow is pointing, typing out your message, and then clicking the send button right here. Your chat will appear in the box right above it. Now, if the chat is distracting to you, you can click on this arrow that will close the chat panel. You won't miss out on the chat, however, 
because I will be reading it and bringing it into the discussion as is appropriate. If you want to send a chat message, just click on that arrow again. The chat panel will pop open, and you can and you'll be able to do that. Okay, let me take care of that. All right, are there any questions before we begin? If you're ready to go, send me a smiley face so I'll know that we're all on the same page. Okay, need a few more. All right, there's some people who haven't sent me their smiley faces yet. Okay, there we go. Wonderful. All right, let's get underway then. Our goals tonight are simple. We have two goals to deepen your understanding of the forces that caused the American Revolution and to provide fresh material and approaches to strengthen your classroom instruction. Now, some of you participated in the forum uh, before the seminar, and we tried to call uh, material from the seminar. Two themes were overarching in your discussion. Was the American Revolution a revolution or a war for independence? And how did the revolution affect the rest of North America and the rest of the British Empire? Professor Green said that those two questions would be too large to address tonight. So he has addressed them, though. The essay that he uh, used to, to address them is available on the form. So if you haven't seen that essay, please go to it after the form and read it. I think you'll find it really illuminating and helpful. Now, we are happy to have with us tonight Jack P. Green who was a fellow of the National Humanities Center not once, not twice, but three times. He is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor Emeritus of Humanities at Johns Hopkins University, and he has written widely on Atlantic history and the American Revolution. We couldn't put all of his publications on one slide, so we offer you those, and we want to point out that next year uh, his latest book will be out, The Constitutional Origins of the American Revolution. So let me now pass the discussion to Jack. Let me find his name here. And Jack, the, con the seminar is all yours. OK, so I, uh, I, I have to apologize to the people on the uh, seminar uh, if I'm a little inexpert at this. I've never done an online seminar before. I have never used a PowerPoint uh, slide. So uh, with those, uh, I might be a little awkward uh, coming uh, Manipulating this machine, and Richard, have you turned the uh, power point over to me? Yep, it's all yours, Jack. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, we begin here with a with a map, which may be uh, useful. Uh, the main question posed for this seminar tonight uh, the, is the question of whether the American Revolution might have been avoided. To come to some determination on this question, it may first be helpful to underline a few facts. Uh, known, uh, I'm sure, to all of you, but not always given sufficient uh, emphasis. The first is that the context for considering our big question tonight is the history, not of the United States, but of the British Empire, which raises the uh, raises three, uh, which Richard uh, just had up on the screen before I switched to the map. Uh, the first question is how that empire was organized. Uh, the second question is what its components parts were, and the third question is how they were held together over such a vast expanse of water and uh, territory. In 1776, and this map shows this rather uh, clearly, uh, the empire consisted of a central uh, kingdom, uh, namely composed of England, Wales, and Scotland, which had just joined that kingdom in 1707. Um, and a variety of overseas appendages, uh, which included the neighboring kingdom of Ireland, uh, roughly by 1776, 32, not 13, but 32 American colonies, all but a few of them with fully functioning British style governments, almost all of them dating back to the 17th century, a scattering of trading factories in. Afri on the African coast, down on the West African coast, you can see that on the uh, map, uh, large chunks of territory in India uh, presided over by the East India Company, and some strategic sites, uh, Gibraltar and Menorca in uh, southern uh, 
Europe. What held this conglomeration together was not force or even uh, close metropolitan management, as in the case of many 19th and 20th century empires. Rather, it was held together by powerful cultural and commercial ties and by affection. And this was in no part of the empire more true than in the American colonies that stretch from Newfoundland in the north to Barbados in the southern uh, West Indies. Thomas Pownall, who was governor of Massachusetts during the mid-1750s, was well informed about colonial attitudes toward membership in the empire. And he spelled out this point uh, fully in a passage from his administration of the colony, uh, one of the fullest and most perceptive of many efforts to analyze the character and governance of the empire after about 1750. Richard? Okay, I'll, I'll use my best 18th century uh, imitation voice here. <clears throat> it has been often suggested that care should be taken in the administration of the plantations, lest in some future time these colonies should become independent of the mother country. But perhaps it may be proper on this occasion, nay, it is justice to say it, that if by becoming independent is meant a revolt, nothing is further from their nature, their interest, their thoughts. If a defection from the alliance of the mother country be suggested, it ought to be and can be truly said that their spirit abhors the sense of such. Nothing can eradicate from their hearts the natural, almost mechanical affection to Great Britain which they conceive under no other sense, nor call by any other name than that of home. Besides, the merchants are, and must ever be, in great measure allied with those of Great Britain. Their very support, call, their very support consists in this alliance. The liberty and religion of the British colonies are incompatible with either French or Spanish government, and they know full well that they could hope for neither liberty nor protection under a Dutch one. No circumstance of trade could tempt them thus to certain ruin. Any such suggestion, therefore, is a false and unjust aspersion on their principles and affections and can arise from nothing but an entire ignorance of their circumstances. Now, in this uh, passage, I want to call your attention especially to Pownall's emphasis on the natural, almost mechanical affection of the colonists to Britain. In passing, you may also note Pownall's casual assumption that the colonists could not colonies could not possibly make it on their own, and that the only alternative to British rule would be French, Spanish, or Dutch rule, not independence. And his stress on the compatibility of liberty and religion and trade preferences uh, with uh, uh, British rule is something you should also uh, take note of. In a view that many colonials shared, Pownall linked the, colo the colony's allegiance to their inheritance, which identified Britain as home to their incorporation into British political, legal, and religious traditions and to their commercial uh, networks. Moreover, the patriotism Pownall described had never been stronger than it was at the successful conclusion of the Seven Years' War in 1763, which uh, drove the French, pretty, mu pretty much drove the French out of, uh, of, of uh, North America and uh, left them only a few colonies in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, examples of uh, this uh, colonial patriotism include the uh, two passages uh, on slide uh, two. Um, one from Benjamin Franklin expressing his pride as a Briton uh, in the British reduction of Canada, and the other by Thomas Barnard, a minister in Salem, Massachusetts, expressing colonial gratitude for Britain's rescue and protection of the colonies from the French. Uh, Richard? Shall I read this? No, well, can re maybe. Joyce, more sincerely than I do, on the reduction of Canada. And this not merely as I am a colonist, but as I am a Briton. I have long been of the opinion that the foundations of the future grandeur and stability of the British Empire lie in America, 
And though, like other foundations, they are low and a little seen, they are nevertheless broad and strong enough to support the greatest political structure human wisdom ever yet erected. And then Barnard. Now commences the era of our quiet enjoyment of those liberties which our fathers purchased with the toil of their whole lives, their treasure, their blood. Safe from the enemy of the wilderness, safe from the gripping hand of arbitrary sway and cruel superstition, here shall be the late founded seat of peace and freedom. Here shall our indulgent mother, who has most generously rescued and protected us, be served and honored by growing numbers with all duty, love, and gratitude, till time shall be no more. As an aside at this point, please note the nature of the expectation for the colonies expressed in these passages. Uh, Franklin projecting that the future grandeur and stability of the British Empire would lie in America, and Bernard suggesting that the colonies, protected by Britain, would become a seat of peace and freedom under British auspices till time shall be no more. In this context, the questions become, first, how these powerful ties could possibly have been so far dissipated over the next 12 years as to bring most of Britain's American colonies to discontent, resentment, and, where possible, open resistance to British authority, and eventually to drive 13 of Britain's contiguous continental colonies to separate themselves from Britain altogether. And second, whether and how this weakening of traditional ties might have been avoided. Uh, to grapple with these questions, we need to appreciate a few other features of the existing situation. First, historians conventionally depict the parties to the struggles that led up to the revolution as Britain on the one hand and America are more properly, the colonies on the other. But this narrative convenience conceals the complexity of both entities. The British political nation was by no means agreed on the policies and actions that produced colonial discontent. Throughout a powerful op opposition, opposed measures that would offend such economically valuable appendages and badges of Britain's internal, international standing as the colonies, and it adamantly opposed using coercion to try to enforce offending measures. As for America, there was no such entity when the altercation began during the Stamp Act crisis, and no more than a loose, defensive aggregation when war broke out in 1775 and independence was proclaimed in 1776. Union was not the fulfillment of some ancient aspiration, but a necessity uh, to put up a, a good fight against the military might of the strongest country in the Western world. The National, Histor uh, National Humanities Center website is particularly efficient at showing the emergence, uh, mostly after 1774, of a body of thought that stoutly opposed the intensifying resistance in the colonies and thereby prevented the emergence of a wholly united front against the British. But in understanding how and why the American Revolution happened, it's important to comprehend that the most significant division to overcome was not between loyalists and patriots, but among the colonies themselves. Again, we can turn to Pownall uh, for an expression uh, of the received opinion on this subject, an opinion held in both uh, Britain and the colonies. Um, okay. Let's see now. One more. Okay, so. Jack, before we get to that, though, we've got some interesting comments here in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, one participant says, didn't Thomas Powell predict that the colonists would resist Britain's increased imperial authority and military presence after the war? Another writes, the way I read Powell, he thought that if the colonists came to the conclusion that the British were hostile to American interests, they would look to their own devices. And our final comment here, um, Franklin called the Albany Congress in 1754, which was an early call for unity. How do you reconcile that with his attitude in the quote? 
Uh, well, uh, I'll start with the last question uh, first, uh, uh, which is that the uh, significant thing about the Albany Union uh, is the Albany Plan of Union is not that it was proposed, but it was universally rejected. Uh, no colony accepted it. It was only a few visionaries like Frank, Franklin and Governor William Shirley of Massachusetts and a few others who uh, uh, thought up this uh, idea. Uh, and it just uh, the, the degree of, uh, of, well, I think the main point about this is that the relationship of every colony with Britain was about 300 times more powerful than re the relationship of that colony with any of its neighbors. Uh, the trade ran that way. It didn't run up and down the coast. Uh, and there was relatively little marrying across uh, uh, provincial lines, uh, et cetera. Now, as for the other uh, 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 questions, uh, that's right, and we'll get to those quotations in which uh, Pownell makes exactly those uh, predictions uh, as we uh, uh, proceed. Um, and um, if the uh, uh, and, and he 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 did actually make both of those points, as both Dennis and uh, Nancy uh, uh, suggest. Uh, at the moment, uh, however, I want to emphasize the point of disunion. Um, and uh, in, in this quotation from uh, from Pownall, but which was also, I think, uh, this fear of disunion was also one of the leading inhibitions uh, in American resistance proceeding faster than it did. It was actually, this fear was a deterrent uh, to uh, uh, taking things to uh, a higher, higher level uh, until the situation became uh, uh, more and more intolerable after 1774. Richard, would you read that question? Okay. <clears throat> it is essential to the preservation of the empire to keep the colonies disconnected and independent of each other. They are certainly so at present. The different manner in which they are settled, the different modes under which they live, the different forms of charters, grants, and frames of government they possess, the various principles of repulsion, that these create the different interests which they actuate the religious interests by which they are actuated, the rivalship and jealousies which arise from hence, and the impracticability, if not the impossibility, of reconciling and accommodating these incompatible ideas and claims will keep them so forever. Uh, as Pano explained in this passage, each of the 13 colonies that revolted was an entirely separate political entity from the other, from each of the others, and the implications of this factor are very important. It meant that there was not just one resistance movement and ultimately not just one revolution going on in America, but 13 resistance movements and 13 additional revolutions, a Virginia Revolution, a Massachusetts Revolution, a South Carolina Revolution, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, if one wanted to do a, a, a uh, really highly sophisticated uh, uh, history of the revolution, but one would have to take into account the extraordinary differences in the nature of the revolution and, and the nature of the way in which uh, uh, various states participated in the war uh, by looking at the social character of each of these uh, polities and taking it uh, uh, into account. Uh, not many historians have, have tried to do that because it would be, of course, a narrative uh, nightmare. Uh, John Adams uh, uh, was uh, strong on this uh, point in this brief quotation, which uh, Richard will read, which is the next slide up. Uh, the principles of the American Revolution may be said to have been as various as the 13 states that went through it, and in some sense as diversified as the individuals who acted in it. Uh, and I suppose uh, one of the uh, things one might say in response to, in, 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 as an observation on this quotation, uh, is that uh, uh, the various interpretations that historians have come up with about the American Revolution uh, can find, almost any interpretation can find some support precisely because of the diversity uh, that uh, John Adams uh, identifies. Uh, the integrity of each uh, colony uh, also means that it's very difficult and extremely misleading to try to establish a central narrative of American resistance. 
which is to say that the American Revolution cannot be told, as it so often has been, simply as a Boston um, or a Massachusetts event, uh, or as Timothy Green uh, tells it in his latest book, which I see Re uh, Richard recommends to you uh, on, the, um, on, uh, on an earlier uh, communication, as a New England uh, a phenomenon. If some of the principal events took place in Massachusetts, such as the Boston Tea Party and the early battles of the war, the revolution could not have happened without the leadership and support of the other colonies, especially that of Virginia, the oldest, largest, most populous, and wealthiest colony, and that of New York uh, at the very beginning of uh, during the Stamp Act crisis. Which brings us to the critical question of expectations in both the colonies and Britain about the future of Britain's American empire in the wake of the great British triumph in the Seven Years' War, a triumph that drove the French out of North America and brought Bengal of four disputed West Indian islands, Florida, Canada, and at least nominally the indigenous controlled Eastern Mississippi Valley region under British oversight. This expansion of the empire created expectations, especially in government circles in London, uh, that, that, that with the, the French out of the way, the old settler empire in America might be rationalized or modernized. And we can again turn to Pownall uh, for a description of this uh, mood. Uh, let's see if I can get that slide, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Several changes in interest in territories which have taken place in the colonies of the European world on the event of peace have given a general impression of some new state of things arising. One cannot but observe that there is something, some general idea of some revolution of events beyond the ordinary course of things, some general apprehension of something new arising in the world, of some new channel of business applicable to new powers, something that is to be guarded against on one hand or that is to be carried to advantage on the other. There is an universal apprehension of some new crisis forming. Uh, but expectations differed widely on opposite sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the next slide, uh, still another quotation from Pano, provides an accurate guide to colonial uh, political expectations. Richard? Okay. The people of the colonies say that the inhabitants of the colonies are entitled to all the privileges of Englishmen, that they have a right to participate in the legislative power, and that no commands of the crown are binding upon them further than they please to acquiesce under such and conform with their own actions thereto, that they hold this right of legislature not derived from the grace and will of the crown, that, that this right is inherent and essential to the community as a community of Englishmen, and that therefore they must have all the rights, privileges, and full and free exercise of their own will and liberty in making laws which are necessary thereto, uncontrolled by any power of the crown or of the governor. So what's, what's crucial to understand about this quotation is the broad claims that Pano, uh, who has just been a governor 10 years, uh, six or seven years before, uh, attributes to the colonies, colonists, uh, that they are entitled to all the rights of Englishmen including especially the right to consensual governance, that is, uh, having a legislative power, that this right was inherent, that is, inherited by them as English people and not derived from the grace and the will of the crown. And you could throw in there any charters that came uh, from the, pound, uh, from the uh, crown, because conventional English jurisprudential uh, theory regarded charters not as the grant of something new, but as the recognition of something that people already had. That's the way they interpreted the great charter, the Magna Carta. On the very last point, uh, only on the very last point, did Pownall exaggerate, and even here, he was correct that colonial legislatures thought that they were not bound by any crown instructions or decrees. They did, however, admit the governor's power of veto and the British Privy Council's right to disallow laws. 
Note also that Pownall here makes no mention of Parliament's authority over the colonies. Uh, why? Uh, well, it's because that had never been an issue in the imperial past. What Pownall leaves implicit here is that many colonials assumed that the metropolis in gratitude for enormous contributions to the war effort by most of the colonies would now act to guarantee the inherited self-governing rights that the colonies have been claiming and exercising since their foundings. British colonial officials had a quite different agenda. To provide a more detailed view of what some British administrators were thinking, we can turn to Governor Francis Bernard, who in the late 1750s succeeded Pownall as governor of Massachusetts. His pamphlet uh, lays out uh, and advocates an extensive program for constitutional and other kinds of reform in colonial administration. Only a few points need to be uh, considered here. We put the, the, some of the main ones up. But Richard, do you want to? Okay, Jack, before we get to that, we have some questions here. First okay. of all, Judith Batten is asking about Pownall's uh, description of the expectations of the colonies. Was that valid? Was Pownall right about that? Oh, I think he was right. I think that's exactly what colonists had been uh, claiming and exercising for a very long time. They resented the, there had been a lot of battles in the 1750s as the Crown had tried to use instructions to force legislatures to do various things they wanted. And these legislatures just wouldn't, were absolutely adamant. They just wouldn't agree to any of these things. And there was nothing the Crown could do, could do about it. Uh, so, Dennis Go ahead. Dennis Frank points out what might be a con contradiction in Powell's point of view here. On one hand, earlier, Powell was talking about how disunited the colonies were. And now in that last quote, he appears to be generalizing about the colonies as a whole. So well, I the, think that they... Expectations is widespread? I think that, uh, that uh, this is an interesting point. But the, what they shared was a common commitment to a British cultural heritage that emphasize liberty as the basic characteristic of uh, British identity. And by liberty, they meant uh, uh, having a parliament uh, that uh, was an instrument to, uh, uh, through which uh, participants in the polity could uh, 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 give their consent to all the laws they lived under. And secondly, uh, a judicial system governed by the rule of law and by certain specific uh, traditions. Those, those things, and, they, and there, there are other things in the British identity that are important too, like uh, Protestantism, uh, for instance, and like uh, a commercial orient, uh, oriented economy. Uh, and these uh, uh, things, I think, are part of a common heritage that in each colony uh, had been uh, uh, customized to fit the conditions uh, created by the people who lived in that uh, colony, uh, but are nonetheless thoroughly reflected in the laws of the of each of the colonies, and that gives these people, I, in my view, that's the. It's not the fact that they live in America so much. It's not even the fact they're contiguous uh, to one another, but it's the fact that they have uh, this common cultural inheritance that makes it relatively easy uh, uh, for them to unite. Uh, when they when they uh, have to do this, so so when Powell is talking there in that particular quotation about what these uh, people uh, uh, want, what these colonists want, he's really talking about his experience in Massachusetts. Uh, but since his brother is the secretary of the Board of Trade, he also knows a lot about other colonies as well, and he knows that these uh, that these uh, uh, aspirations. Uh, are these these views of the colonial constitutions and the broader imperial constitution of the whole empire uh, are are pretty much the same wherever you go. And it doesn't stop in those 13 colonies. You find Jamaicans, Barbadians uh, saying exactly the uh, exactly the same thing. This is a common uh, uh, British uh, uh, cultural expression uh, that is uh, a foundation on which to build. Uh, some kind of uh, union, and it could have been a broader union than the one that was actually built. Mm -hmm. We have a quick question from Nancy Zenz here. She asks, um, did some Americans reject both King and Parliament? I guess she's referring to the 1760s. Of course, they did later on. Yeah. 
Well, uh, they don't actually, they have great respect for parliament, even when they're opposing parliament's um, uh, intrusions into um, uh, colonial affairs. Uh, parliament was an august body in their, in their whole mythology. Uh, and, and so was the, the king. I think they, they were all pretty good, pretty good uh, Britons, but they, they uh, never thought of parliament as having any jurisdiction over them. They're certainly not over their domestic uh, affairs, and so their their respect for Parliament, and especially when Parliament wouldn't listen to their petitions uh, and pleas, uh, went steadily declined, and they kept appealing to the king, as we'll see later on in these uh, discussions, as an inter as as a, an, a mediator. But the king, of course, was entirely tied into the English political or the British political system. Uh, and he didn't. Uh, uh, he, he never gave these petitions the time of day that the, uh, that the colonists sent to. Mm -hmm. And Carla Fetterman uh, writes, um, she was under the understanding that pre-1774, Americans were really rejecting Parliament. First, its right to tax, then its right to legislate as well. And that only after that did they really reject the king. So what you said earlier would, would, would say that Carla's perception is correct. That's right, except that uh, they're not claiming there is, this is not just a tax rule. And uh, we'll uh, come to that when, in, in about 10 minutes. So, um, okay. yeah, should, should we go? Do you want to read any of these things? From, uh, well, I, I, Jack, we're, we've got about an hour left to go. I think perhaps yeah. if you could indicate which of the which slides are most important, I'll read those. And then uh, you can just point out what folks need to. Uh, to get from the slide. Well, why don't I just why don't I just do that? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, because people can read this slide up there. Uh, Bernard here laid out. It's almost like Luther's uh, 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 piece of paper that he tapped, put up on the on the uh, wall of his church. He's got 97 propositions. I think Luther had 99, but I might be wrong about that. But Bernard here sets out a very a different set of assumptions about the post-war. Uh, organization of the empire, one that asserts the colony's subordination to Britain and to the British Parliament. It denies, and that's what's really quite remarkable here, that consensual governance is an absolute right of British subjects and argues that every American government, and by that he's not just talking about these 13 colonies, he's talking about Jamaica, Barbados, all these, all these various colonies, that every American government could have its constitution altered for the better, that the territory integrity of the colonies might be violated in the process. Who needs Rhode Island uh, or who needs New Jersey or who needs Delaware? Uh, they could be incorporated into some a larger uh, uh, entity. And, and this is simply not true, that the colonists after the war expected a revisal and reformation of the American governments. Um, that being in that that time, being in uh, Bernard's view here, as he lays out in his very last uh, statement, the critical time to reform the American governments upon a general constitutional, firm, and durable plan before it became impracticable. There was a sense that if if these reforms weren't uh, carried out relatively soon, the colonies would be too. Uh, uh, populous, too wealthy for uh, any reforms ever to be uh, undertaken. Uh, what I think uh, people like Bernard didn't realize is they were already too wealthy and populous and so forth uh, to be undertaken uh, successfully. Now, uh, Pownall uh, certainly agreed with Bernard that if some reforms were undertaken, they should be pursued in a comprehensive according to some comprehensive plan. In fact, his administration of the colonies was intended as just such a plan and not, as in fact would happen, through piecemeal measures without, as Pownall put it, connection to any whole. And he suggested that the Crown review the existing constitutions of the colonies to see whether the colonies had, over the many decades since their foundings, become too independent of the government and laws of the mother country. But he was far more sensitive than Bernard to colonial opinion. And he uh, tried to explain the uh, uh, dilemma in the next uh, slide here, which I think is probably one you should read. Huh. Okay. I, I can't move this. Wait a minute. No, I can't. I was 
There okay. we go. Yeah. Okay. If the colonies are to be possessed as a right and governed by the crown, then a revision of these charters, commissions, instructions, so as to establish the rights of the crown and the privileges of the people are hereby created, is all that is necessary. But while the crown may perhaps justly and of right in theory consider these lands and the plantations thereon as its domains, and as of special right properly belonging to it, while this is the idea on one hand, the people on the other say that they could not forfeit nor lose the common rights and privileges of Englishmen by adventuring under various disasters and difficulties, under heavy expenses and every hazard to settle these vast countries, to engage in untried channels of labor, thereby increasing the nation's commerce and extending its dominions, but that they must carry with them, wherever they go, the right of being governed only by the laws of the realm only by laws made with their own consent, that they must ever retain with them the right of not being taxed without their own consent or that of their representatives. While these totally different ideas of principles whereon the government and the people found their claims and rights remain unsettled and undetermined, there can be nothing but discordant, jarring, and perpetual obstruction in the exercise of them. Uh, Tano's state analysis was a fair statement of the conflicting assumptions about how the empire was organized and of the respective roles of metropolis and colonies in imperial governance, all laid out clearly. And I want to emphasize this well before the Grenville measures of 1764 and 1765 brought this conflict sharply into focus for all concerned parties uh, to see. Uh, the Grenville reforms of 1764 to 65 were a sort of first step in the direction uh, recommended by uh, Bernard, Pownall, and many others in the metrop metropolitan political uh, imperial establishment. And the colonial response to them immediately suggested how far colonial establishments were willing to go to preserve what they thought of as their inherited rights as British people and the constitutions they had constructed for the colonies over the previous century and a half. Because these reforms applied to the whole of the British Empire, they elicited protests far beyond the bounds of the North American colonies. But the fullest and most adamant objections came from New York and Virginia, who together and without coordination took the lead. It's important to note that these protests dating from the fall of 1764, all followed not upon passage of the Stamp Act, but upon its initial proposal in Parliament. New York's protest took the form of a petition to the House of Commons, while the Virginians protested in three separate documents, one each addressed to the King, the House of Lords, and the House of uh, Commons. Richard? Yeah. That from the year 1683 to this day, there have been three legislative branches in this colony, consisting of the governor and council appointed by the crown, and the representatives chosen by the people, who, besides the power of making laws for the colony, have enjoyed the right of taxing the subject for support of the government. Under this political frame, the colony was settled by Protestant immigrants from several parts of Europe, and more especially from Great Britain and Ireland. And as it was originally modeled with the intervention of the crown and not accepted to the realm of England before or Great Britain, since the Union, the planters and settlers conceived the strongest hopes that the colony had gained a civil constitution, which so far at least as the rights and privileges of the people were concerned, would remain permanent and be transmitted to their latest posterity. It is therefore with equal concern and surprise that they have received intimations of certain designs lately formed, if possible, to induce the Parliament of Great Britain to impose taxes upon the subjects here by laws to be passed there, and as we who have the honor to represent them conceive that this innovation will greatly affect the interest of the crown and the nation and reduce the colony to absolute ruin. It became our indispensable duty to trouble you with a seasonable representation of our claim of our constituents to an exemption from the burden of all taxes for granted by themselves. 
The uh, New York petition is uh, very long, uh, as seminar members will know, who read uh, the documents assigned. And attentive readers will note that it went way beyond the sentiments expressed uh, on the slide uh, that we use here to claim an exemption from trade duties uh, and to point out the incompatibility of the Navigation Act with such an exemption. And this is a very radical claim at this particular uh, time. The material on this uh, particular slide that Richard just read is intended to draw your attention to the New Yorker's claim, not just to an exemption from parliamentary taxation, but to the civil constitution they had enjoyed since 1683 and their claim to that constitution on the basis of invariable usage and custom. Uh, Jack Tyler Rust acts, um, it is, is it significant that the first protest against British taxation came from the wealthy white landowners? What would the common man know of these taxes? Well, uh, the uh, common uh, people in America, contrary to a number of historians, uh, were quite involved in the uh, politics when, uh, and, and uh, political elections and so forth, whenever they wanted to be. I mean, uh, the freedom not to participate, not to, not to vote, was, has always been a basic uh, American freedom going back to the, the colonial period. So as long as things were going fine, they frequently uh, didn't vote. Uh, but their ideas were, uh, were uh, not just molded by uh, these elites, but uh, also subsumed by uh, a common culture that ran around the uh, colonies. It wasn't just the elites who thought that uh, uh, the uh, uh, colonists had the rights of Britain. It was just about everybody. Uh, and, uh, and that is everybody among the free uh, population. And there were a whole lot of people among the black population who were also uh, uh, knew about these rights and liberties uh, and who aspired to participate uh, in them as, as, as well. Uh, so, so that's, um, uh, you know, I mean, and, and I think there's no reason to suppose that this petition did not represent the uh, sentiment of people in all social strata and in uh, rural areas as well as urban areas, whatever the interesting divisions uh, are in New York politics. And the same goes for the uh, Virginia things, which, we'll, which we will take up in, in a moment. Uh, are either of those other questions you want to bring up? Yeah, I think, I think you've actually answered Chris Hughes' question. He wanted to know about, um, See, to what degree did these sentiments expressed in the New York petition, uh, the thoughts of most colonists were simply the political elite? And I think you've answered that question. And Donald Fogno, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, uh, raises the point here that I think has occurred to a lot of people. It seems that Britain was more concerned with Europe, France, than the American colonies until 1765 or so. The attention to the colonies then showed how the two had grown apart without people realizing it. Would you say that was true? They had grown apart, and people really weren't so aware of it until this pressure got put upon it. Upon well, it. well, there are two. Uh, I think it is true that they did not understand uh, that not very many people, Powell being one of the few who did, uh, they did not understand on either side uh, exactly uh, how different they had become. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's also possible to make the argument, uh, and a number of historians have, uh, quite plaus plausibly that uh, the colonists were never more deeply British uh, than they were in the 1760s and early uh, 70s, and more committed to, uh, to being uh, British. But what they couldn't stomach was the failure of metropolitan Britons to recognize their, uh, uh, their, their Britishness. Uh, so I'm not quite sure that the cultural differences are so uh, powerful uh, as uh, 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 Donald uh, suggests uh, here, or as that line of interpretation uh, suggests. So the Americans felt they were British, but the British didn't feel the Americans were quite so British. Well, no, there's a long uh, uh, history going back to the very first days of the of the founding of colonies that portray, per, uh, portrays people who go to the colonies as great, greatly inferior English people. I mean, who would go out to that wilderness 
who had anything at all, any standing or any wealth in Britain itself. Uh, and uh, maybe a few religious fanatics like the Puritans, and that's the way they were looked at by uh, by, by the English. Uh, and since that time, uh, a lot of uh, criminals have been transported to the colonies. A lot of poor people or poorer people went as indentured servants. Uh, a lot of people went as uh, single people. I mean, there was a there's a whole literature you can read. Uh, Mal Flanders, Daniel Defoe's novel. Or even better, his his less well known uh, uh, novel Captain Jack, for instance, uh, to see. I mean, the, the theme in there is uh, is how people gain redemption in both novels. Is how people gain re- redemption by going to the colonies from lives of crime uh, in uh, England. But the whole suggestion when they get in when these when Captain Jack and and uh, all Flanders get get to America. Uh, they find uh, some really pretty vicious people, uh, and uh, also culturally backward, and so forth. And this this is a powerful tradition. And if you read uh, English uh, uh, writings uh, expressing resentment at uh, the American um, uh, response to Stamp Act, for instance, it's just full of these of invective of calling these Americans bums essentially, uh, and uh, descendants of uh, religious fanatics are. Are of uh, convicts, uh, or of other uh, uh, people who couldn't make it in Britain itself. So, so in effect, what's happened? I mean, we normally think of Europe's confrontation with the rest of the world, uh, beginning in the 16th century, as the discovery of other very different, uh, and in the European view, savage peoples in uh, Africa and in uh, in uh, America. Uh, and those people, uh, social scientists refer to often as others, uh, and uh, in a kind of with a big O. But what's actually happens, and I don't think the British are the only uh, European power who does this. Uh, what actually happens is that people who stay back in the metropolis create, make, turn colonials into others, and this is so deeply embedded in their consciousness. That it, of these metropolitan populations, that it has a lot to do with the way they respond to these upstart colonies. Who are they claiming these rights? Are they even British any longer, uh, or had they ever had they ever been British? So it's it's a very complex situation and needs to be looked at from a very long term uh, perspective, which is difficult to to do in a class on the American Revolution, you might never get to the uh, Stamp Act, as a matter of fact. Okay, Jack, we've got about 40 minutes left to go, so let's Mm -hmm. uh, proceed. Okay, uh, let's uh, look at the uh, uh, slide from uh, Virginia there. Um, And is that the petition of the king? Yes, I can't actually read this, uh, read these things here, um, because there's a box covering, it says mute and so forth, uh, covering about half of this quotation. Uh, but could you read this, um, or maybe I could just, uh, if you look at the bottom of this slide here, let's look at the bottom of the slide, because essentially they're, the Virginians are repeating much of what the New York said. And it, on the left-hand corner, uh, it says that uh, uh, it asks the king to protect your people of this colony in the enjoyment of their ancient inestimable right of being, of what? Of being governed by such laws respecting their internal polity and taxation as are derived from their own consent. Now this is, this, uh, uh, the Virginia petition is, is notable because it represents the first instance during the revolutionary crisis in which an American assembly made it explicitly clear that colonial claims to an exemption from parliamentary authority extended not just to taxation, but also to laws relating to their internal polity. In other words, they were claiming not merely no taxation without representation, but something far, uh, much more far reaching, no legislation about their domestic affairs uh, without representation. As the passage from the uh, Virginia Remonstrance to the uh, House of uh, Commons on the next uh, uh, slide uh, suggests, moreover, uh, uh, the Virginians labeled the exercise of any such power as anti 
constitutional. The term unconstitutional, which we are now very familiar with, uh, was a, a not a very uh, it was a, a new term, and and uh, and so it, it it actually acquired currency during this debate with uh, Britain. But what was at issue in these contentions, though, was the colonists' claim to a, to an equality of rights with Britons on the basis of inheritance and usage. So it, it, it's not just the taxes. Now, people often say, well, there must have been deeper ulterior motives. Uh, they must have been aiming at independence. That's what a lot of British uh, people uh, did say, uh, because these taxes aren't very much. They don't, and they, they're, they're slight taxes. But why should these colonists complain? Well, these, these, this taxation was a badge of inferiority. Uh, and it was their identity as Britons uh, that was what was really driving them. They and and if they were uh, if they could be taxed without their consent, then they couldn't be true Britons. And if you weren't a true Briton, you had to be a slave, like the French or the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Germans or all the other uh, people uh, of the continent to which uh, the British had for several centuries been very uh, condescending uh, in those uh, terms. Um, but the British government ignored uh, these documents on the grounds that they were disrespectful of parliamentary authority and proceeded to pass the Stamp Act. During the brief debate over whether to pass the measure, Charles Townsend, uh, a member of parliament and former member of the Board of Trade, the institution responsible for immediate uh, oversight of the colonies, succinctly uh, articulated uh, the uh, majority of view. Uh, and here, I, I don't know if you really need to read this um, um, uh, quotation. I mean, the important point is that he, he says there at the end of the first paragraph, the, the very word colony implies uh, subordination. Uh, and uh, in this passage, in his speech, uh, he uh, dismissed uh, these colonial petitions as nothing but complaints that didn't have any proof and that cheekily raised questions about Parliament's right to tax the uh, colonies. And he notes in his very first sentence that in the debate in the House, nobody uh, actually uh, uh, questioned Parliament's right to tax the colonies. Now, during his speech, uh, Townsend had suggested that Britain had planted the colonies with so much tenderness, governed them with so much affection, and established them with so much care and attention. And immediately after he was finished, uh, our Isaac, Colonel our, uh, Isaac Beret, uh, who had served with the Army in America during the Seven Years' War and was now an MP, rose to challenge uh, Townsend's account of Britain's role in establishing and nurturing the uh, colonies, uh, in which he uh, points out that the colonies weren't planted by Britain's care. The colonists themselves uh, supplied the energy and endured the hardships and the money. Uh, Britain gave, uh, put up no money uh, at all as a state uh, to found any of the colonies until the founding of Georgia in the early 1730s and then the uh, Anglicization of Nova Scotia in 1748. Those two colonies alone uh, had had uh, subsidies. He also uh, said, they nourish by your indulgence. And uh, he says, they grew by your neglect of them. And as soon as you began to care about them, uh, then uh, you sent over incompetence to rule over them and uh, who misrepresented their actions and uh, who uh, created this bad opinion of them uh, in England. And then he said, they protected by your arms. And they, uh, they say, well, they had, the Americans themselves had, had nobly taken up arms in uh, defense of Britain's war uh, with, against the French. And of course, uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was true. Um, uh, but Beret was one of the relatively small number of metropolitan leaders who appreciated the extent to which many of the colonies, including those colonies which were uh, most uh, out front during the uh, 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 resistance to British legislation, including Virginia, uh, New York, 
Massachusetts, and Connecticut, all of those colonies had extended themselves financially in raising money and troops for the Seven Years' War. In fact, the only real laggard in that was, was Maryland, which somehow managed to raise very little money uh, through various disputes with its proprietor. Uh, when news of uh, Parliament's actions reached America, uh, Virginians again took the lead in passing Patrick Henry's inflammatory resolutions of May 30th, uh, 1775, which in one sense didn't go too far beyond the uh, documents that we were just considering um, from Virginia. It reiterated the claims they made the previous year but it did go beyond them in explicitly calling for resistance to prevent enforcement of the Stamp Act. Circulated to the other colonies, these resolutions inspired other legislatures to follow suit and stimulated a call for an intercolonial Congress to seek repeal of the act and a general boycott of British trade to put economic pressure on British merchants. In the resolutions they passed, not all the colonial assemblies pressed for exemption from legislation as well as taxation. Massachusetts at this early stage was notably backward in this regard and was sufficiently influential at the Stamp Act Congress in New York to prevent the inclusion of such a claim from getting into the declaration that Congress uh, produced. But a majority of the legislatures of the continental colonies did adopt such a claim. Uh, many people in Britain uh, responded to these resolutions and the economic uh, boycott and violence against stamp masters and other British officials with demands for military repression and enforcement of the Stamp Act by the Army. Had George Grenville still been in office, he might have heeded their demands. He probably would have. He made a number of speeches in that direction. As it happened, the Rockingham government, which had succeeded Grenville, was filled with people who deplored such a coercive policy, and the government used the demands of British merchants who feared economic ruin from colonial boycotts to push through repeal. Significantly, however, the accompanying uh, uh, a repeal by the Declaratory Act, which asserted Parliament's authority over the colonies in all uh, cases whatsoever, made sure that absolutely no concession was made to the constitutional claims of the colonies by the repeal of the Stamp Act. The hope of the Rockingham Ministry was that the Metropolitan Government would follow the Irish precedent. That is, that having declared its legislative authority over an overseas territory, as Parliament had done with Ireland in the 1720s, Parliament would prudently cater to colonial expectations by thenceforth refraining from ever taxing the colonies again. But the Rockingham administration, of course, was short-lived, and it was, in fact, the only administration sympathetic to the colonies during the entire period from 1763 to 1781. A vigorous opposition continued to insist that trade, not dominion, was the principal value of the colonies to Britain, and to press for lenient measures by altering the traditional uh, harmonious relationship between metropolis and colonies, by laying bare two conflicting interpretations of the constitutional organization of the British Empire, the Stamp Act crisis had created profound suspicions on both sides. Witness the warnings from British merchants to, British, to Boston merchants, which urged the colonies to show gratitude and to behave in ways that would not further offend the uh, honor of uh, Parliament. Um, Richard, do you think we okay. should? Okay, Jack, before we get to this, <clears throat> we've got some questions uh, okay. uh, raised here in the chat. Uh, prior to this time of crisis, did Parliament ever explicitly declare their authority over the American colonies, or was it merely assumed? Were the colonists pointing to something in particular, or were they just appealing to broad principles? And if we could answer that quickly, because we, we're running out of time. Yeah, well, uh, the, the question is that the Declaratory Act is the first time Parliament ever formally declares that. Uh, people in Parliament had uh, made this uh, point. Uh, in the 1750s, uh, the uh, British administration was trying to tighten up using Crown authority, uh, colonial administration, and when they didn't get anywhere, they threatened that they would bring Parliament into the situation. But there is, in fact, no such uh, declaration uh, of uh, uh, like the Declaratory Act before the Declaratory Act. 
-hmm. Now, what about the day? Did Parliament have the right uh, and the power to pay, to tax? Well, that depends on uh, who you're talking to. I mean, th th this, th these constitutional discussions are never unilateral. I mean, we assume uh, in this country nowadays <laughs> uh, that uh, for the past 50 years, at least, that uh, the federal government, whatever the federal government wants, trumps everything else. Whatever Congress uh, says trumps everything else. Uh, but in fact, that was not the way the British Empire worked. Uh, uh, the empire was a negotiated empire. Uh, the British Constitution had actually nothing to do, except as a source of certain principles, with the colonial constitutions. Each colony had its own uh, constitution, had long had its own constitution. And furthermore, the relationship between those, the British Constitution and those colonial constitutions uh, was uh, negotiated through something that was emerging but didn't yet have a name, which we would call an imperial constitution. And according to that imperial constitution, as colonials interpreted, and their opinion was as good as anybody's in Britain, there are parties to this same discussion, uh, their uh, colonial uh, uh, opinion was uh, that uh, Britain uh, had control over the external affairs of the colonies because they were all in the same empire. And that might involve Parliament, as it did in the Navigation Acts, and as it did in providing money for defense. Uh, but uh, that the internal affairs of the colonies were the uh, affairs of those colonies, not, and Parliament could, could legislate. We, that's what Pownell said before, and that's what he was, and on that point, I think he was, he was absolutely right. And the colonies have a very good case. Uh, there's an extraordinary body of work by a man named John Philip Reed, who is a a professor of law at New York University who must have written by now at least 10 or 12 books on the legal history of the American Revolution. And in this, he, he shows how good the American uh, or the colonial claim was in the law. Uh, and in my book, uh, Peripheries and Center, uh, I uh, make this case uh, also that here are two conflicting interpretations, but we can't say that one is right uh, and one is not. You can't just assume that the strongest power uh, has the most authority, and especially not if those on the other side won't accept it. Right. So the question, that's the whole question that uh, this crisis was built upon. Does Parliament, did Parliament really have the right to impose its will on the colonies? And Parliament said yes. The king agreed. And uh, uh, the colonists said no. Okay. Well, let's move ahead, Jack. We've got less than half an hour. Okay. Uh, um, from the, um, uh, I, we won't read that uh, that passage then from the uh, merchant. So it's a very interesting document because what they're saying is that uh, we did you a favor and we got this Stamp Act repealed. Uh, be grateful. Uh, don't press your luck. Don't take any violent measures, uh, etc. And if you do that, then Parliament probably won't try to. Uh, do anything else in relation uh, to you. Well, they're immediately um, um, answered uh, uh, by a number of people. Um, and uh, the general uh, opinion was that uh, uh, we are going to go on complaining because we have other grievances. Now that this one has been reject, uh, re uh, uh, redressed, we have other things we'd like to do uh, that we think need to be done. Uh, and after complaining that the a uh, repeal of the Stamp Act left many colonial grievances on the books. Uh, the Virginian uh, planner, uh, George Mason, who is uh, is uh, writing here on the on the uh, next slide, and I won't have uh, Richard read it in the interest of time. But Mason, who would, uh, uh, was a very interesting figure, who would later become the author of the first American Bill of Rights, the Virginia uh, Bill of Rights, which was passed by the Revolutionary Legislature in the spring of 1776. In a hard-nosed answer to the uh, British merchant's letter to Austin merchants, reasserted a colonial claims to traditional British rights for British colonists on an equal basis with metropolitan Britons. And what he essentially says uh, in that uh, uh, document uh, is that uh, 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 as long as you don't infringe on these rights, and if you'll redress some of them, uh, then we'll, you know, everything will be fine. If you don't, you, know, you can expect more resistance. 
Uh, in a pamphlet published near the end of the uh, Stamp Act crisis, uh, Richard Bland, a Virginia's leading constitutional theorist, tried to illuminate for both colonial and British leaders the transatlantic division of authority that I was just talking about that had been worked out over the previous century and a half and that guaranteed uh, and would continue to guarantee colonial enjoyment of British rights. And essentially, this was an argument based on custom because this division between internal and external had existed over the past 100 years or so, uh, colonists thought uh, in ancient uh, British uh, constitutional uh, theory uh, that uh, uh, custom and usage had given it as much legal authority as any statute or charter uh, could give it. Uh, and the English uh, simply uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't recognize that. Uh, but the distinction between internal and external spheres of government was crucial to colonial constitutional conceptions, and it's very well expressed uh, by uh, Bland in those few, uh, in that short uh, passage. In effect, the uh, climate of mutual submission, uh, suspicion that emerged in the Stamp Act crisis made the traditional relationship between Britain and the colonies extremely dysfunctional. And when, in the wake of the Stamp Act, colonists effectively ignored the advice of British merchants and continued to press for metropolitan acknowledgement of colonial assertions of entitlement to full British rights, including especially the New York Assembly's refusal to comply with the Parliamentary Quartering Act requiring colonies in which British troops were stationed to pay for housing and feeding them, demands from hardliners for repressive measures became too powerful for the Pitt Ministry to resist and Parliament renewed the controversy with the Townsend measures, which included some small uh, taxes uh, of 1767. And these uh, uh, taxes and measures provoked a new and longer crisis that lasted for about four years, uh, during which renewed colonial boycotts of British goods did not lead to repeal, as in the case of the Stamp Act. Significantly, during this dispute, both sides took a conciliatory position. Uh, thus, the principal and earliest protest against the Townsend Acts, the farmer's letter, uh, letters by Pennsylvania lawyer John Dickinson, uh, was carefully contrived to limit colonial objections to parliamentary authority uh, uh, to matters of taxation alone, which amounted to a careful pulling back from the previous bold assertions that the assembly's exclusive jurisdiction, which is asserted the assembly's exclusive jurisdiction over all legislation for the internal polities of the colonies. And most official pro uh, uh, protests during the Townsend Acts followed Dickinson's uh, lead. On the British side, the urge to resolve the contest through conciliation was manifest in the eventual repeal of all the taxes, except a token tax on tea and a promise to impose no taxes in the future. Yet for many people in the, in the colonies, and this is very important, the crisis over the Townsend Acts went on so long that it provided a stimulus for people to think through more thoroughly the vexed question of Parliament's jurisdiction over the colonies. By the end of the controversy, a number of thinkers had already reached the conclusion that they would hold after 1774, to wit, that while Parliament had no constitutional authority whatever over the colonies, the long-term colonial acceptance of its trade regulation, which went back to the middle of the 17th century, gave Parliament a customary right to make laws for the colony's external affairs and the colonists a customary obligation to obey those laws. The Massachusetts Circular Letter circulated to the other colonies endeavored to lay the uh, foundation for this uh, 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 position. Note here that the, uh, uh, if you look through that, we won't read it. Note here that the letter directly challenges the emerging British doctrine of unlimited parliamentary authority by calling forth an older doctrine of constitutional supremacy over all government institutions. That is the idea that the government is subordinate to the constitution, uh, which is a doctrine that goes back at least as far as the mid 15th century when English legal writers had insisted that unlike other monarchs of the time, England's king was subject to the law and could not change them without the consent of the people. 
Note as well that freedom from taxation is asserted in this document, both as a natural right, which is not all that usual, and a constitutional right, meaning an inherited British constitutional right. Even more impressive, though, uh, was a pamphlet uh, by uh, James uh, Wilson, uh, another Pennsylvania lawyer. Should I stop here for some more questions? Well, there are some questions here about how <clears throat> widespread support for the revolution was, about how, what percentage of the uh, colonials were patriots, what loyalists, what percentage neutral, and how much of a real popular movement it was. Uh, you could answer that now quickly, or we could save I, that I would, till the end. Yeah, let's save that till the uh, till the end. Okay. Um, I think that uh, to say that a third of the population was loyalists is an enormous exaggeration. Uh, and I think to uh, say that uh, only one third of Americans were uh, were uh, willing to rebel is also an enormous exaggeration, er, exaggeration in the opposite uh, direction. In 1774 and five, there's a massive uprising uh, of all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, uh, and uh, that's very that, that's very impressive, and it stunned uh, British uh, officials. Uh, but um, uh, I do think that there were a great many Americans who didn't give a hoot about the war or these issues because they were doing what Americans do, which was pursuing their own happinesses in the private sphere. And they didn't like the war very much, because not because they were loyalists, uh, but because and not even because they were neutrals. That's too uh, 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 much of a term, but, but or, uh, too precise a term for them, but because they were just were uh, concerned about uh, their own vines and fig trees and uh, uh, building up their own uh, and making, eking out their own uh, private uh, lives. So there was a lot, there were a lot of people who didn't participate uh, in the revolution on one side or the other. That's not what they came to the colonies to do. They came to colonies to make, uh, primarily to make a better life uh, for themselves. But we can talk more about that in the, uh, at the uh, end here. Uh, I, I do want to point out here about um, uh, uh, James Wilson, that he was a recent immigrant from uh, Scotland, and he wrote one of the most impressive analyses produced during the pre-revolutionary -re pre era, considerations on the authority of parliament, in 1769, and in this pamphlet, Wilson laid out the constitutional grounds for the claim that the colony's constitutional connection with Britain did not involve either House of Parliament, but was entirely through the king. And that became uh, the American uh, 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 position uh, after 1774, widely held, uh, though uh, it was already held when, when um, uh, Wilson wrote, and he didn't publish his pamphlet until 1774. It was widely held by a few people like Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Adams, among others, uh, but it didn't become a predominant until 1774. For the time being, however, and in relationship to the question tonight, this is a very important point. Uh, the settlement of 1771 uh, eased tensions and strongly suggested that a rapprochement had been found that might preserve the British Empire entire. Not that the years from 1771 to 1773 were entirely quiet, especially in Massachusetts, South Carolina, and Maryland, where major disputes occurred between colonial legislatures and colonial governors, or Rhode Island, where open violence erupted over British efforts to stop colonial smuggling. But none of these involved parliament or parliamentary regulations. And colonials had long since proven that few royal executives were a match for a purse controlling colonial legislature. On the bottom line, Parliament's authority during these years was rarely questioned. And colonial resistance was minimal and unnoticed by Parliament. East India Company corruption and rapacity in India and the Carib War in the West Indian colony of St. Vincent attracted far more parliamentary attention. And then a contemporary might have surmised that the opposition position on the treatment of the colonies had won the day, that commercial considerations, not abstract questions of parliament's colonial jurisdiction, would this, thenceforth dictate colonial policy, and that things would continue to simmer down in the colonies where, though leaders continued to distrust the British administration and to sniff out any signs of a design to oppress them, 
we're by no means trying to make a revolution, a concept that seems quite ill-suited to the American Revolution. I don't know of anybody who is trying to make a revolution. During these years, in fact, it's even difficult to think of it in the 1775 and 6. Within Britain, the old fissure, and you might say the fissure was between accommodationists, the opposition, and coercivists, uh, the government, remained. Yet almost everybody in all camps agreed that parliamentary authority extended over the whole empire. Even the opposition uh, thought that with significant numbers hold, holding that it should never be exerted in, way, in ways that would offend colonial assemblies. Uh, in the absence of easily available British documents expressing these positions, uh, Benjamin Franklin's satirical uh, 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 rules by which a great empire may be reduced to a small one can serve to uh, illustrate the, the point. Uh, but here again, uh, I won't uh, bother to uh, read them. I just call upon you when you have time to look over these passages to uh, note the suggestion common to opposition politicians that the value of the colonies to Britain was commercial and defensive, and that generous treatment was the best route to retaining colonial affections. And note also the contrast Franklin draws between this position and the administration's penchant for contemptuously uh, repressive uh, measures. As we all uh, know, uh, what upset the delicate accommodation that occurred between 1771 and 1773 was Parliament's effort to bail out the East in India Company, which by making company tea cheaper in the colonies inadvertently triggered colonial fears that the drop in price was a fiendish device to get them to pay parliamentary taxes and thereby exceed the Parliament's authority to tax them. The measure evoked a level of resistance not seen since the Stamp Act crisis, including colonial refusals to permit the tea to land at colonial port, the most famous instance of which, and the most violent instance, lost the Tea Party. Uh, this resistance provoked in Britain loud and insistent demands for coercive measures to force the colonies to submit, and punitive measures against Massachusetts. Opposition leaders generated a massive campaign in Britain, first to head off and then to abandon such measures on the grounds that they would only alienate colonial affections still more, that they would unite the colonies in resistance and would ultimately prove unsuccessful anyway because Britain could never manage to put together and finance a force sufficient to conquer such a large population dispersed over a large co continent. And that even if they did, they would destroy the colonial economies the very thing that in op opposition eyes made them uh, essential to the mother country. Now with the passage of the Coercive Acts in 1774, in my opinion, the British government forfeited all hope of retaining those American colonies that had the capacity to revolt, short of making concessions to colonial constitutional demands and thereby turned the dysfunctional relationship created by the Stamp Act crisis into a situation that had general potential, genuine potential for war and revolution. That, as the opposition had predicted, the government had miscalculated in believing that colonial resistance was the work of a handful of malcontents in New England, and that the colonials uh, would never uh, dare to take the British Army, uh, take on the British Army and Navy, immediately be became clear in the colonial response to the coercive acts, uh, which included a massive outpouring of support for Massachusetts uh, and a meeting of the Continental Compo uh, Congress composed of delegates of all the colonies to coordinate resistance, and that Britain had driven the hitherto disparate colonies to united action was illustrated in the Congress's uh, Declaration of Resolves and Grievances, which was a bold articulation of demands on which the vast majority of colonial leadership was determined to stand uh, firm. Uh, and the uh, first four collections on this, uh, uh, first four resolutions on this uh, slide, which I've uh, put up, express the terms, uh, the formal acceptance of which by the British government was necessary for the colonists to call off uh, their uh, resistance. Uh, note that these resolves explicitly, explicitly deny any authority to Parliament for legislate, to legislate for the colonies, but do not uh, offer to abide by parliamentary acts that represented 
uh, but did, I mean, uh, that represented genuine regulations of the external commerce of the colonies. Uh, note as well, however, uh, that the, this acceptance was not, as previously, based on customary constitutional usage, but only from the necessity of the case. Even after Parliament, despite the protests of the opposition, had summarily exist such concessions, after the ministry had authorized the use of force against the colonies, and after actual military hostilities had broken out at Lexington and Concord in April 1775, the Second Continental Colonies uh, Congress repeated uh, these terms in July 1775 with the so-called Olive Branch Petition. At the same time, it was issuing a declaration justifying its taking uh, up arms. It justified that on the grounds that it was preventing the ascent of the uh, colonies uh, into uh, uh, slavery. And uh, once, uh, uh, and, and on the other side, it was met by a proclamation from George III declaring the colonists uh, rebels uh, and uh, uh, th through uh, by royal edict uh, and opening the way for a full scale uh, military attack on it. Now, once the issue had been defined in these ways, the possibility of keeping the empire together was, in my view, lost. Military and naval operations against the colonists turned opinion in a still more determined direction, and the logic of declaring independence and inviting foreign assistance became ever more powerful. And thereafter, uh, Congress refused periodic efforts to negotiate the return of the former colonies to the British fold, even though in 1778 the British offered by repealing the Declaratory Act to grant them the autonomy, legislative autonomy they had sought. This repeal was, incidentally, enormously beneficial to the self-governing aspirations of Ireland and those colonies that, too vulnerable to revolt, remained in the empire. So the answer to the central question we have been preparing to confront in this seminar is that the American Revolution could not have been avoided, at least not with the cast of characters in power. The terms colonial laid down at the, uh, colonials laid down at the time of the Stamp Act crisis were essentially non-negotiable, uh, at least as long as the uh, British government persisted in denying them, and the British government was too sanguine about Britain's military and naval capacity, too contemptuous of colonial resistance capability, too committed to the idea of parliamentary omnipotence, too protective of parliamentary honor, and too poorly informed about the debt and depth and breadth of colonial resistance to give in to American demands. And when they did learn better early in the war about some of these things, the concessions they offered were too little, too late. However, the search situation would certainly have been different had the opposition ever succeeded in getting into office. The opposition was too sensitive, too sensitive to the commercial military advantages of a continuing connection with the colonies too appreciative and proud of the free character of the overseas empire, and too aware of the strength of the ties of culture and affection that had always held the empire together to risk alienating the colonies. With the opposition in power, there's no reason to suppose that the 13 colonies would have revolted or ever joined together to form the United States, which was purely an adventitious result of the war. There's every reason to suppose that the colonies would have developed into one or more, probably more, self-governing commonwealths under Britain's aegis of the kind subsequently achieved in other groups of settler colonies in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Possibly, although, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, possibly, um, although there are two plausible views on this question, had the 13 colonies not left the empire, slavery might have been abolished earlier and peaceably in the colonies, it became the United States in the way that it was in the West Indies in the 1830s. Possibly also, but this is also highly debatable, Britain might have been more respectful of indigenous rights and property than was the United States. Possibly also, contemporary Americans today uh, might have a respect for Great Britain as a mother country to match their fascination with British royalty, whose appeal to a small r Republican like myself has never been able to comprehend. Um, okay. Any other questions? But do we have any? Time? Yes, we do. We do. We uh, people were asking about the uh, Boston Tea Party. First of all, did John Hancock own any of the tea that got thrown into the harbor? Ah, I can't remember that. 
but I don't think yeah. he did because I, I'm pretty sure none of this T, t was consigned to him. So the answer to that question is no. Okay. Uh, did Thomas Hutchinson own any of that tea? I don't think Hutchinson owned any of that tea uh, either. Uh, that tea was sent, consigned to uh, some merchants. No doubt Hutchinson was quite merchant, but I don't think he had any uh, shared it. He was more or less out of mercantile business by that time anyway. Uh, okay. And then let's see. Tyler Rust asks, <clears throat> if the revolution had such widespread support in Boston and other places, why then did the Sons of Liberty disguise themselves as Native Americans when they tossed the teens to the harbor? Why hide? Oh, well, uh, because they were, <laughs> there was a large British Army establishment in, uh, in Boston at the time. And while the army, the, the local courts tied up the uh, army so they couldn't do anything uh, much, but they, they were there and their possibility of a confrontation was strong. So, so I don't know why they dressed up as Native Americans specifically, but the urge to disguise themselves was, was strong. They didn't want to be discovered. There, were, there was a statute on the books that permitted taking rebels and traitors uh, to England for trial. And uh, that was something they were trying to avoid. That's right. Uh, since Spain and then some other uh, extent, see, uh, some extent Napoleon held on to slavery, Spain beyond the 1830s, is it entirely fair to assume that slavery would have been abolished in mainland North America earlier? That, that was just some speculation, right? No, well, well, I mean, the best argument about this is a recent book by Christopher Brown called The Moral Capital. But the, his, the historian of slavery, David Davis, has also uh, uh, made this point, which is directly opposite to the point I made. They argue that if the North American slave colonies had stayed in the empire, they would have joined with the West Indian colonies and created such a powerful lobby that slavery might never have been abolished. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's a plausible argument as well. They're both counterfactual arguments, of course. Okay. Uh, and then were there any other tea parties beyond the one in Boston? Oh, yes. There, were, uh, there was a famous tea party. In, uh, in, well, the, the, the tea was – the, the important point is uh, – not that there were other uh, tea parties, uh, but that there, the tea was confiscated and uh, or else returned to England. In some places, it was returned to England. In other places, it was confiscated and later sold to pay for military expenses of the, of the new states and the new revolutionary governments. Okay. And then when did Britain abolish slavery? Well, Britain abolished slavery in the early 1830s. They abolished the slave trade about the same time or just after the United States did in 1807. Uh, but they didn't abolish slavery. And there were actually, actually about 30,000 slaves in Britain when slavery was abolished in 1832. Uh, and then there were, of course, thousands and thousands of slaves in British uh, uh, colonies. Uh, and that lasted really until 1836 because they went through a certain uh, uh, period of, of amelioration and so forth. Uh, so okay. Britain didn't. I mean, Britain uh, uh, thought of itself as a place that didn't have slaves. And the famous Somerset case of 1772 said slaves who set foot in Britain, they only applied to this one slave, uh, are breathe the free air of Britain are free. But in fact, that wasn't the case. There were a lot of slaves in Britain. Okay. And we'll give the final question to Donald Fognow. Uh, let's see, is there any consensus about how much illegal trading uh, the colonists engaged in prior to 1763? Yeah, there's, there's a fair amount, and, and it was, it was uh, substantial uh, during the, um, during the Fr uh, French and Indian War, during the Seven Years' War. Uh, trade was mainly with uh, uh, neutral colonies uh, in the West Indies, but they would, through, by going to a Dutch colony, they could buy French molasses from French colonies. Uh, and so uh, it was an extensive, it, but it was an extensive phenomenon. But it was principally limited to Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and to a smaller extent to uh, Connecticut. It was mainly New Englanders, a few New Yorkers, but not many uh, were seem to have been engaged in in this trade. Okay, and we'll actually give the final question to Tyler okay. Rust. Well, maybe could, not. Could I, could when I, John I, Adams defended the soldiers at the trial of the Boston Massacre, did he suffer any popular criticism? Well, no. Uh, well, he may have, but in general, not. He didn't suffer any loss of reputation because he was upholding the rule of law, which all these people believed in. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you wouldn't know it from the tar and feathering that was being done to, to uh, some people, but nonetheless, they, they, they did have this fundamental belief that the court should be uh, 
should should uh, decide the issue on its merits. And so I think that that, that uh, you know that, that Adams didn't suffer very much. Okay. Well, I hope that you'll continue posing your questions on the form. Professor Green will be checking it out until October 29th, and he'll respond to you. And please let me remind you to go to the form to find the piece Jack wrote about whether or not the revolution was a war for independence or an actual revolt. Go to the form, too, to share fresh approaches and discussion questions that work in your classes, and also to report on the effectiveness of seminar texts you use. Please remember to submit your evaluations. I want to thank Jack for giving us an excellent seminar this evening, and I want to thank all of you for your intelligent and enthusiastic participation. I hope you'll join us again. Thank you very much. Now to escape the classroom, up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see File. Click on Can that. I just make just... one point? Okay, Jack, go right ahead. Very and that is, I'm going to be in Mississippi for the next two days, so if you raise a question and I don't answer it until Saturday, uh, Actually, I'm going to be in Baltimore on Saturday, so it may be Sunday or Monday before I answer these questions. Okay, right. fine. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you can escape by clicking File. There'll be a drop-down menu. I think the last item says Exit Session. So thank you very much. Hope to see you again. Well, Jack, what do you think? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I can't find the way to turn this off. All right, I'll 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 direct you there. I thought it went pretty well. How about you? Oh, I, well, yeah, except that it was, and there were so many questions there. You know, each one well, that's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, it was good, yeah. Yeah. Well, so if we I do this again. This yeah. We'll, we'll cut it down, and but yeah. I, I thought it went well. Yeah, okay, now, to escape, go up to the upper left-hand corner. It says File. Oh, Click on I that. Get to I, it's okay, there's a – up in the – all right, Jack, in the upper right-hand corner of that box, there's an X. Click on oh, that, yeah. and it'll close it. Under File, I get File? Uh, now, well, can, can you get to File? Yes. Okay, click File. Yeah. There should be Leave a drop down training. menu. Leave training session. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jack. Okay. Good night. Bye -bye.